everyone. How is everyone doing today? You guys, thank you guys for being here with us today. I am so excited to have you guys here joining us. Um, I am excited to be here, standing here, just to share a little bit of what God has placed on my heart for you. Uh, like Pastor Brent said, we are in the holiday season, and this is my probably my favorite, most favorite time of year. I'm, I'm always a kid at heart, and, and during the holiday season, I am more so even a kid, even during that time. So um, we're thankful for you guys being here. My name is James Reels. If, you, if you've never met me before, I am the life group pastor here at Westover. And some people always ask, well, what does the life group pastor do? What is, it, what is that all about? Uh, the life group pastor, basically what we do is we make this big church feel small. We want to get you connected. We want you to get plugged in with friends. We want you to get plugged in with, with, with Christ. We want you to grow in your faith. So the main purpose of life groups is grow together. Everybody say grow together. One, that's, that's wonderful. One more time, grow together. That's what we want you to do. We want you to grow in your faith, and we want you to grow with your friends. And there's no better way to do that than in circles and, in, and just spending time with other believers, sharpening each other, loving one another, encouraging one another. That is the big purpose of life groups. And if you're looking forward for a new transition in 2019, I want to encourage each and every one of you, join a life group. You, you won't regret it. Your life will be changed. We want you to join a life group. If, you're, if you say, you know what, I want to go to the next level then do that. Lead a life group. Open your home. Allow people to come in. I guarantee you, your life will be different. Your life will be changed. You will be going in a, you'll be taking yourself to a higher level than you've ever expected in your Christian faith. So I encourage you, get plugged in with the life group. So that's really what we do. So Pastor Jim had asked me to speak um, on this, on this Wednesday to, to you guys, just kind of give you some encouragement as we head into the holiday season. And I just didn't know, I think, Pastor Jim, is there a series? Is there a topic? He says, no. Just focus on yourself. Talk on yourself and introduce yourself to everybody. And I don't like talking about myself, but the one thing I kind of really enjoy talking about, honestly, is my family. Um, I have a, a couple of pictures of my family up there. Uh, my wife's name is, is Bev. There she's right there. That's us. Uh, that's us young kids. Right there, 20 years ago in February, we'll be married 20 years. That's, that's, I, that's, a, that's a great accomplishment. So happy she stuck with me through all my craziness. But that's my wife, man. She had just turned 20 years old. I just turned 22. We were kids. We were young. We had our whole life ahead of us. We didn't know what we were doing. But, I mean, what, what does a 20-year-old and 22-year-old know about marriage? Hey, man, I don't know. We just go to Disney World. It was like a free trip. It was like, it was just fun. And we enjoyed ourselves. And we had our life ahead of us. And we want to make the most of every moment. And by doing that and, and by having fun, we decided, hey, guess what? Let's, let's, let's fulfill God's first commandment commandment, and that was to multiply. So we had five kids. And so that, so there we are. We have our five kids there. Uh, my, uh, we have four girls and one boy, and that's us in front of a fire truck, and I'll explain some of that in a bit. But our our, our, our girls are wonderful. Our oldest, Brielle, uh, she is an evangel right now. She is pursuing what God has for her. I said her name because she wanted me to say her name online. So, sweetheart, there you go. Um, and then we have and then we have my second daughter, Bailey, who is a senior, and she's getting ready to transition out, hopefully not go too far, hopefully stay close. And she's in Dallas, and she texted me. She said, Daddy, give me a shout-out. So there it is for you as well. Um, and be, remember, we, I know you're watching us here online, but remember, God is always watching you where you're at. All right? So, that, so that's the deal, is that we want them to know. And we just, we just, I love my daughters, and we're just entering a new transition in our life. Uh, my third daughter there, the one with the curly hair standing there as well, that's Beth. Bethany, she was so excited that the, the, the election that took place was not a female because now she still has hope of being the first female president. So in 2040, if you see Bethany, vote for her. That'll be good. She'll bring America back to the people. And then you have, and then you have my daughter, Brooklyn. She is just our free spirit, our zany one. We never know what she's going to do, what to expect out of her. She's just so much fun. She's great. And then last but not least, our boy. Um, I, my wife said, I need a boy. I said, I only can produce girls to apparently, and we prayed hard, and we got those girls in, and so finally we prayed, we prayed, and he is truly, 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 and that maybe that's for another time, he is an answer to our prayer, he is all that I could ever hope for, he is my bud, I love him, but keep him in prayer, because he's living with five women, and that is just not healthy for anyone, so that's what I need you guys to do, so that's my family, um, and, and the reason why we had the picture with the fire truck is, is because I spent 20 years in the fire department, and that really wasn't God's plan, I mean, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yes. Woohoo! And 
that was my dad. My dad said, hey, I want you to be a fireman. He was a fireman. My uncle's a fireman. And that really, and in my mind, I'm 5'9". All my brothers are over six feet tall, man. I'm like, I am not built for a fireman, but this is the plan that God had for me. And, and because at five years old, that's when I gave my life to the Lord. And people always say, how can a five-year-old give his life to Christ? But I did. I can, I can tell you, and this is, like I said, maybe another time, I can tell you the exact place. The date was October 6, 1981. I can tell you what the preacher was preaching about, what he was doing, how my heart felt, how God, how I felt like the worst sinner in the world. And he didn't do anything to, to force anything. He didn't scare Jesus into me like it was popular back in the 80s. He just said, Jesus, love me. And that he died for my sins. And man, I felt like the worst sinner in the world as a five-year-old. And I can remember the Holy Spirit just doing something in my heart. And walking up to the stage as a five-year-old boy. And just saying, and just saying God, come into my life. And from that moment on, there was, there, from that moment on, it, 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 it began to push me in a direction that, that is just the most wonderful adventure I could ever go on. And that adventure is the uh, of living passionately and pursuing everything that Christ had for me. And, and believe you me, I wasn't perfect. And, and believe you me, I've made mistakes. But the one thing that I was passionate about was Christ, passionate about his word, passionate about teaching. And, and as God, as I began to grow up as a 16-year-old boy, I started pastoring. I was a kid's pastor at a church in San Antonio. And then I helped started planning churches and helped develop new, new ideas for, for churches who were struggling. And then God began to push me through that. And I knew, I said, God, this is my call. This is my purpose in life. Until I turned 19 years old and my dad I was like, join the fire department. I said, fine, I'll join the fire department. I'll do it. And I joined, and I did both for, and I did both for 20 years. So uh, serving the Lord for 37, being a, working in ministry for 25, working for the fire department for 20. And it seems like all this stuff can kind of get in our way. So many things that can distract me from pursuing God's purpose. Because as I got ready to retire, people were like, you're crazy. Don't retire. There's money at the end of it. But there was something more important that, than money. There was something that was driving me to pursue what God had truly called me for. And if you have your Bibles, and that's what takes us to our, to, our, to, our, to our text today, if you have your Bibles or the app, you can open it up in Philippians chapter 3. I mean, we're going to kind of camp out there for a little bit, specifically Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And there's these passages as I was thinking about what am I going to talk about in, in such a limited amount of time? How am I going to, how am I going to bring it home? How am I going to just explain something to, to everybody who's here in attendance about, about what God has for them and what God can do for them? And in the book of Philippians, they say the theme is about joy and, and, that, and that in all things we have to be joyful. And Paul is in prison writing this book about joy. It's like, how do you write a book about joy in prison? It's just ridiculous, but he's doing that. So as we're going through, we're finding out that, you know, what joy is and that, and that joy is beyond ourselves. We need, to, we, need to, we need to humble ourselves and be a servant, and, and, and that's where we find true joy. And then in chapter 3, we find out some things where he begins to list you know, his qualifications, because people are starting to boast and brag and causing the church to do things that, that are legalistic things that, uh, to, to reach a certain level. But Paul says, he says, hey, no one has the reason to boast because I have, a, I, have a, I have it all. I've done it all. And he gives his criteria. And then after that, he says what he's pursuing more, more than anything. He's pursuing a knowledge of Christ. He's pursuing more of Jesus. He wants him to the fullest. And the church is thinking, oh, Paul's already attained this. He's already achieved all this. But in chapter, in, in, in verse number 12, in chapter 3, I'll read it. And it says this. He says, not that I have already obtained all of this, which is all, everything that he just written above, uh, knowing Christ and, 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 and all that. He says, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that. Circle that. If you have a pen, circle the word that. For which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to take hold of it. Circle the word it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Now, the one, the reason why I said to focus on that, because when I was a kid, as I was reading this, this hit me as, as a high school teenager, and I have always focused on this passage whenever I evaluate my life, and it's the word that. Out of all those words in that letter, the word that stuck out to me the most, and the reason is because Paul wanted to pursue that. He wanted to pursue the, the that that God grabbed him 
for. And that was for Paul to, go, to pursue and to be the, the, the light and preach to the Gentiles. But he didn't care about anything else. He was straining for the that in his life. The purpose, the reason why Jesus reached out to him. And there's a reason, for those of you who are following Christ, there's a reason why Jesus reached out for you. There's a reason why he died on the cross. And yes, he wants to take you to heaven. But you're here on earth now. You have a mission. You have a purpose to do something for Christ here, whether it's in the church or outside the church at your work. He has a purpose for you. And this is the big idea I just want you to remember. If you don't remember anything, remember this. It says this, I will always pursue the purpose Christ planned for me. That is, that's, it's very simple. I will always pursue the purpose Christ has planned for me. And people get those two words confused, purpose and plan. They're not the same thing. It's kind of like when you get a box of Legos. And I love Legos, but I, I mean, my friends, they're obsessed with Legos. And Legos are crazy. There's a lot of mess. My wife sees mess. I see fun, right? And that's all it is. And so in those Legos, they have thousands of pieces, and as you look at those pieces, you're like, oh, we don't need some of this stuff. But what I've discovered about Lego is that every Lego has a, a sheet that's a plan on how to put it together. But in that box, there's a piece. There's hundreds of pieces. And each piece has an important part in that plan. Each piece has a number. I didn't know that. There's a catalog for each piece that's ever been created by Lego. There's a piece because it has a purpose. And that's the thing. You guys aren't just a number here on earth. You're not part of the several billion people here on earth. You're not just part of the few thousand that are here at Westover. You have a purpose. You have a place that, and you have a reason why God has placed you here. And you need to grab hold of that. So I will always pursue the purpose God has planned for me. So that's what we want you to do. I want you to remember that. And there's a reason why we want to develop a purpose. There's a reason why we want to discover our purpose. There's three benefits to it. One is endurance. If you know your purpose, you're going to keep going forward, right? When you're racing, you see the finish line, you're going to keep going forward. You're not going to stop. You have a reason. You have a goal in mind. No matter what weighs you down, no matter what pulls you back, no matter what's holding you, you're going to keep going because you want to accomplish your purpose. You want to accomplish your purpose. Focus. That's number two. Another benefit to discovering your purpose is that you develop a focus, that you're laser focused, you're zoned in no matter what's in your way. And sometimes we, I remember being a, a kid and hearing people talk, and then as, I grow, as I've grown up, there's been people who have chatted and, 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 and said, well, you know what, when I get older, I'm going to do this. And, so, and in each season of life, we have distractions. If you're a young adult, you're like, well, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do in life yet. And there's, and there's so many things that I could do, and, and I have college, and I have work, and I still haven't figured it out. And there's so many distractions. When I get married, when I have kids, I can discover what my purpose is. And then when you get married and you, get, and you, get, you have kids, then you have a whole set of things. You have even more things that distract you. We have, you have the kids, and you have games, and activities, and marriages, and birthday parties, and work. And you have so many more, all these millions and millions of different things that can distract you from your, from your purpose. And as a senior, we think, oh, I'm retired. But you still have things that can distract. You have, you have trips you want to take, bucket lists, checklists you want to do, grandkids and, and, and doing all sorts of stuff. And we can get caught up in all the mess and all the millions of different things that we lose focus of God's purpose in our life. So when we have purpose, we have focus. And the last one is you have joy. Joy. You have joy and fulfillment when you know the purpose that God has placed in you and you're actually doing what God has called you to do. Some people have always asked, why are you so animated? Why are you so hyper? I mean, you got to have a lot of caffeine or a lot of sugar. I'm like, no, man, it's just, it's just enthusiasm. It's natural energy. Plus, it's having five kids that put that energy in me. It's like, I always got to be active. But it's joy because I know that I'm pursuing. As a five-year-old kid, I am still, I still have the same passion as a five-year-old about the things of God that I do as a 42 two-year-old. Nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is I've seen God prove himself over time and time again. So endurance, focus, joy, if you want those things, pursue your purpose. Now, the question is this, how do we grab that? How do we discover purpose? Well, it's very simple. Paul kind of laid three things out, and if you indulge me, we'll, we'll, we'll move through this. But Paul says that, it says this, if you want to discover your purpose, you have to make it personal got to make it personal. Paul says in verse 12, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He goes after it. Not mom, not dad, not my wife, not my kids. And he's not, being dis and he's not letting culture tell him what to do or, or parents tell him what to do or kids or grandkids or anybody else. He is pursuing what Christ 
is telling him to do. He is following that passion and that purpose. He's made it personal. That word, take hold, is kind of like a football player. And it's so aggressive. And the only thing I can think of is a football player who's running and chasing after someone else. And they grab and they tackle him when they bring him down. That's the kind of take hold. My daughter, Brielle, she is the oldest. and She's very possessive of things. And she had a long time ago, she had a, a bear called Boo. Very creative. Our kids were very creative names. You know, it was like we called Boo. And Boo was her thing. She would not let it go. She had to have it all the time. So one day, we were visiting my, my wife's family in Brownsville. And in Brownsville, we went to go visit. We stayed with her family. And it was time for Brielle to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, Brielle is calling, Boo, Boo, Boo. She's crying for Boo. That's what puts her to sleep. So we're looking, man. We're looking in the diaper bag, not there. Looking under the bed, not there. Looking downstairs, anybody seen Boo? No, we haven't seen Boo. We're like, like, like he's a real thing. And we're looking around, and we go in the car, look under the seats. We're looking everywhere. It's time for her bed. She's getting cranky, and guess what? Can't find the bear. We're like, oh, give her a cup, man. Put her to bed. Put something in it. Give her like lots of cereal to fill her belly and just put her out. And no, she didn't want, she was having nothing of it. Nothing was going to distract her. She wanted that bear. Well, I thought about it. I'm like, guess what? We were at the worst store in the world. We were at Ross. I can't stand Ross, but my wife loves it. And so we're there. So I'm like, we were at Ross. I bet you the bear, I bet you Boo is at Ross. So apparently Ross closes at, at, over there at the valley because over here it doesn't close. So, so, and so here, so we have boots. So I'm like, man, we got to go. And she's up all night long. It was the worst sleep we've ever had. I wake up 8 o'clock. I didn't even know if the store opened up at 8 o'clock. I just woke up, got in my pajamas. And I was in my pajamas and slandals, and I went down to, to Ross, and I saw somebody walk in. I said, the store is open. It's 8 o'clock. And I promise you, I just walked in in pajamas and all, and I made a straight line down to where a rack was with a bunch of stuffed animals. It must have been the Lord that, 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 that guided me because I just walked straight in. I looked in the basket, and there he was laying inside that basket. I picked him up, turned around, and walked out. And I was like, I was surprised no one stopped me thinking I was a shoplifter. I just walked straight out. I guess you could do that in the valley. Just go to a store, pick something up, and leave. But it's like, that's what I did. I grabbed it, and I took off. I got in the car, went home, saw my daughter. She was there looking. She said, boo. I said, yes. And, and I threw at her. She grabbed that bear, put it on her face, and she was out. She was out. And that's how we need to be when it comes to our purpose in life. Let nothing substitute for your purpose. Whatever God has designed you to be, let nothing come in between it. Let, don't let the million things, the millions of distractions get in your way. Continue to hold on and make your purpose personal. Number two, real quick, pursue it passionately. Have passion for your purpose. Paul says he strained and he, and, he, and he went after it. Paul says that he strained after it and that he pressed on. He was passionate about the purpose that, God, that Christ saved him for. And in a few days, man, in the next week's time, we're going to see some passion going on. You know that? We're going to see it on Black Friday, right? Black Friday is a passionate day. You got people camping out on Wednesday for like a little stuffed animal for their kid to have. They're camping. They're, they're, they're making turkey right there in line. They're, I mean, they're, they're doing it. But the first thing, the one thing that they do that I, I love watching on the news and watching YouTube videos is when they open those doors. They open those doors. And there's people knocking people over and kicking wheelchairs out. And they're just running, biting, kicking, and screaming. You know, and they're doing, because they want that gift. They want that gift that's going to change their holiday season. If only we could have that same passion. These people have a passion for something temporary, something that's going to fade in a month's time. But we have the gospel. We have a purpose that God has given us for all eternity. And if we would keep that passion and say, you know what, I'm going to pursue it. No matter what gets in my way, no matter what difficulties come, no matter what happens to me. Because Paul said that he forgot, what, he forgot the past. He was forgetting what was behind. And he pressed forward. Pursue it with passion. There's nothing that compares to knowing Christ and knowing your purpose in Christ. And the last thing is, is this, is live it persistently. Be persistent in pursuing your, your goal and pursuing your purpose. Live it persistently. Don't give up. Don't let anything get in your way. In verse 12 it says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. But then Paul, in, in, ver, in chapter 4, verse 13, one of the most famous verses we'll read in Scripture, he says this, he says, I can do all 
things through Christ who gives me strength. He was persistent. He knew, that the, he knew that God never changed. He was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same God that's the same is his strength is the same. That word that, that gives me strength, that word, when you, when you read it and how it, and how it describes what God does, God's, what happens is, is that it's a continual renewal. It's a continual giving of strength. When you feel weak, God is like, God, give me strength again. No, God continues. He gave you that strength in the past. He's going to give you it now. He's going to continue to give it in the future. As long as you remain in him and pursue your purpose, God will give you the strength you need to accomplish all, of, all the things that he has for you. And this is the, and, and, I, and, and, and I'm going to close with this, guys, is that in my life, serving the Lord for as long as I have, and people say, man, well, you're a young guy. Yes, but sometimes it feels like, and you may relate to me, sometimes it feels like at times that we've walked a thousand miles. It feels like that we're just tired and, and, and like, how did I get here? And me standing here looking at you, looking at this, at this camera and being here at Westover, I think that about myself even right now. And it's only God's mercy that draws me continually to him. And it's by his grace that I stand here today before you. Because if you get to know me, there's a lot of things that could have torn me away from my purpose and from being here. But it's God's grace that sustains me. It's his grace that empowers me. And, it's, and in all my 37 years of serving God, there's one thing I know. There is nothing like that. There is nothing when, like pursuing your purpose that God has for you. And I want to challenge you with that, guys. Always pursue the purpose that Christ has planned for you. Pursue it. Make it your own. Pursue it passionately and live it persistently. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. God, I thank you because you have just blessed me, God, with so much. As I see my family and I reflect and be thankful for all the things that you've done, God, I pray that my friends in this room would be thankful for all the things that you've given them, that you would encourage them, that you would build them up, that you would sustain them, that they would know that they have a purpose, that, there is, that they should not be content with where they're at, not to be content with just knowing about you, but to pursuing the purpose that you have designed for them to be, what you want them to reach. God, during this holiday season, there's a million different things that can distract them from your purpose. God, I pray that they would remain focused on you. And as 2019 approaches, and as we go into that year, God, may you give them a fresh and a new sense of what it is that you have for them, God. May they discover that purpose. May they discover all that you have designed them to be. And God, may they not be, may, not, may, may they not be lazy, but may we be relentless in our pursuit of you. God, we thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the opportunity just to share my heart and hopefully just encourage just a little bit, God, for them to, to go on on their day and in their week and even, their, and even if possible their year, that they would know that they have purpose and the plans that you have designed in this great scheme that you've designed, God. We have purpose in it. We love you, God, and we thank you for your faithfulness. Go with us as we enjoy our week and bless us and encourage us during this holiday season. In your wonderful name, amen. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you. You are dismissed. Enjoy your week.